Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with Matt Swally. Matt, how are we doing? Hi, Gabriel. Thank you so much for having me on the Shades of Entrepreneurship. No, I'm excited. In fact, where are you calling in from? Because we're talking about uh, my beloved Raiders and you're a big Colts <laughs> fan. So where are you calling in from, Matt? I've lived all over the past 15 years. I'm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and then our headquarters is actually in San Francisco. From the oh key. man, you are in the yellow towel territory <laughs> right there in the thick of it. So uh, Matt, we're going to be talking about OmniKey today, but before we get into all that, let's introduce the, the listeners. Who is Matt? Yeah, so I am chief business officer and a co-founder of OmniKey. I joined OmniKey about two and a half years ago, a uh, very early stage in the company, which we can talk a little bit more about earlier. I was employee number three. But before that, I spent 13 years at AT&T, large corporation for many years. It was the Fortune 10 company. I led uh, teams and organizations uh, in, primarily in direct sales in all over the U.S., Atlanta, Southern California. I finished my last five years in Dallas at the headquarters um, where I did like a chief of staff role working for one of the major executives uh, that ran the global business side of AT&T. In my last two years in corporate strategy, I got I always had this huge passion for entrepreneurship and took the leap over to an early stage startup, joining a very great visionary CEO that knew generative AI was going to continue to get better. But I grew up in Indiana. Um, that's why I'm a Colts fan and moved all around. And I still, you know, it's got a good place in my heart for from a sports perspective and and, and living there. I love it. I love it. And we're, we'll get back to uh, certainly kind of talk about your experience in the corporate world from a strategic perspective. So I'd love to kind of hear how that has transitioned into this entrepreneurship world. But before we get into all that, tell us, what is OmniKey? What does it do? Sure. So what OmniKey does is, is we're an artificial intelligence plow powered marketing platform. And what we do is we take real time performance data from advertising. So think about all the digital places, Gabriel, that you know the listeners are at: Meta, Google, TikTok, LinkedIn, websites, mobile apps. We can we have integrations with data, and we can help determine what's leading to clicks or purchases. We use that data to feed generative AI and new content. And there's a couple of big tailwinds in content generation. Really, one is today creative is the major lever for distribution and advertising creative matters more and more because personal information is becoming more restricted and the second thing is ai enables greater personalization it's not one to one but you can scale easier it helps you really well with ideation of new ideas for potentially different audiences like if you're selling a product or service or your SaaS company you could have 10 different customers like let's just say retail banking you want to have personalized creative for all those different audiences it performs better makes your brand better and you can move much faster. You know, that's a great point. In fact, folks, I really want to point this out. Um, what consumers really want is like that concierge services, right? They want to feel that personalized connection that your product and your service and your marketing is geared directly towards them. You know, I, I've been constantly talking about this on the show recently is like the different marketing tactics that individuals have, right? And, and you know, one thing, I actually went back to a former episode from Awarity. Uh, he really is focusing on marketing. And I'm like thinking about that, you know, that sales and marketing funnel, right? And how important that top piece of that funnel is because there's so many different touch points throughout an uh, individual's life, throughout a, throughout a day right? That will spark an interest in a specific product or service. Uh, for example, you might see a commercial about Cheetos and then you walk around the store and that Cheetos is right there, right? And you saw the billboard of Cheetos. So it's all these different things, right? That add up to that sale uh, that I find extremely interesting. Now, how does kind of OmniKey, how do, how does it kind of work? How do it, like, if, if I'm a, if I'm a client, what, what am I expecting? So there's a number of different ways that technology enables, um, better advertisements. And so what OmniKey is, it's a, it's a technology platform that we built out this data insights and creative insights all in the platform. So you mentioned before seeing a Cheetos ad and then walking into a grocery store and seeing Cheetos. Well, there's one other thing to mention, attention spans continue to get shorter. Google and Facebook used to own like 60% of the ad market. It continues to decline. And there's new channels that arrive every day. So OmniKey wants to help brands, agencies, and, and technology partners follow their customers to all those different places and make it easy. Imagine, like you mentioned, each one of those digital platforms requires a different messaging. You want a standard brand experience 
and safety rails, but it's going to require different messaging. Like some require user generated content, like TikTok. Some um, OmniKey basically has a tool tools that help with the ideation with AI of new ideas. What's the tone of the brand? Who are the audiences? What are the platforms you're advertising on? AI helps conceptualize that. And then it also helps generate concepts, images, a bunch of the other areas, and then piece it together into a finished ad creative. And the last thing is with AI, a lot of people are very reluctant on this, the brand safety issue and what's in it. We have this approval dashboard that gives potentially as many people as possible access to the content before it goes live, where they can annotate, edit, and once they click approve, it goes into the ad platforms. So the future we believe is 10% human input on the front. Like what are your objectives? Who are your audiences? AI can do the middle 80%. The last 10% is review, edit, approved by humans again. Wow. I like it. I like the simplicity of it, but I also like the efficiency of it, right? Where I think one of my biggest, my, my biggest Achilles heel for my own business is the creative piece, you know, spending the time creating content and then putting on different platforms or finding one platform that's able to put it on various platforms and the editing. And there's a lot of different things that goes into play. Now, Matt, I want to take a kind of step back a little bit. I want to talk about, because you mentioned you were in the corporate world, AT&T, and then you started this role. Let's talk about that kind of transition. What, what was the aha moment for you? And was like, you know what? I think we have something here with OmniKey. And what made you decide to take that leap into entrepreneurship? Sure. So one, the big, big companies give you some great, like that you learn organizational behavior, you learn process, you get to lead a lot of different people, you get to do a lot of different jobs, all that stuff correlates to a startup. But it really was my last two years, I was in that chief of staff role. And I went back and got my MBA. And I start I joined corporate strategy. So corporate strategy is big picture thinking, it's doing lots of research on what are the next waves of growth in technology. And I got really, really passionate about it was the bullish year when the, when the stock market was going crazy. They had all these IPOs. Um, and I just got really, really excited about startups where you can jump in and you can make a huge impact. You know, everything you do impacts the company. And so I started doing some networking and I met Hikari Senju, who had He's a Harvard computer science grad. It's his third company. Um, he started it in 2018. So he was way ahead of the vision saying data could impact content generation. and AI was going to continue to improve. And the messaging was was spot on. It's exactly where we, where we are today. So in 2020, we had the first version of the product. Hikari was running engineering, sales, everything. You know, the very early stages, it's kind of, it's, building a plane in the air, learning how, learning from the, the first couple sets of customers, usually they're close to your network. And then after I joined as employee number three, as the business leader, and we've went through a lot of transitions from the early stages to raising, you know, a capital round where we hired a bunch of the next set of leaders that can help us scale the product specialists in AI and in different areas of engineering. And, um, I am, I've always considered myself kind of a risk taker and it was the best decision ever because there's two different paths. I could have stayed at AT&T at headquarters and the opportunity you have at a startup is just, is far greater. Um, if you have that mentality of you're going to fail a lot, but the sky is the limit. Like you can reach out to anyone and potentially connect with them. <laughs> That's what I love about it. And people are very, very helpful at startups where like, if they think you're doing something interesting, they'll they'll introduce you to five different people, like no problem. You don't get that as much in large corporations. So I've really loved a lot of those aspects of it. If you go about with the mentality, I want to help whoever I can with nothing in return, everyone ends up trying to help you. It's it's amazing. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think if you put your consumers, or in my case, you know, in the healthcare world, you put your patients in the forefront of your strategy, you tend to have a pretty good outcome, right? Because you're you're really again. Going back to what we just discussed at the beginning of this conversation is individuals want to have that concierge service, right? They want to feel cared for and about, right? And so that's very important. Now, one of the things you mentioned, right, is you're starting to scale this business and you took on some additional funding to bring on some employees. Talk about the scaling piece. What were some things that you learned during that process that you wish you would have known before you started it? Well, there's a number of things. Um, one is any person that's been in a couple of startups realizes how important focus is. 
Um, one of the things that was a great lead driver in the beginning, it still is, is we run, we run digital ads. We use our own product and it drives in lots of different customers. And in the early days, you know, especially when AI was hot, when it first got really hot, when, uh, when chat GPT was launched, but Dolly was launched, you know, we were taking on every single meeting with every customer and to be really successful at a startup, you have to really zone in on your ideal customer profiles because you have limited resources all the time. Like what is the most important thing you try to execute on? And we were just meeting with too many people and we've continued to refine that process. And um, we started moving up market more so too through the, as we built the product more, just because um, it's challenging with, with brand new businesses. They don't necessarily even have their ideal customer profiles. They're trying to find product market fit. So it's, right. it's, a, yep. it's, a, it's more challenging, but those are some of the things is at the, the next time is you learn how to really identify the right customers that you can learn from and build, you know, build the best product and become really, really focused on some simple things first, instead of, you know, being more wide, you go deep. Yeah. And I think that's a great point for the listeners to kind of grasp onto is, you know, kind of narrowing down your focus, you know, you can't really have the shotgun approach every time. And the way I mean by shotgun approach is essentially you shoot a shotgun, it makes a bunch of impacts, and then you visit every single impact hole and see which one made the biggest impact. That is a very difficult strategy to use. That's, that's a strategy I used in the past. It's very time consuming. And it's it's dreadful, because you're just you burn yourself out. Truth, truthfully, you do. Mm -hmm. Now, what we're kind of talking about earlier in this conversation as well, I kind of briefly mentioned, you know, that marketing and sales funnel. Matt's kind of alluding to the same thing. It essentially, is like every, not everybody, certainly you want everybody aware of your product, right? But not everybody's going to get that concierge services to truly get them into with a purchasing that item because not everybody is your client. I'm sorry, right? Uh, and another thing that, you know, we're looking for product market fit and your MVP, right? Minimal bio product. Make sure that you're asking folks outside of your friends and family because uh, grandma is probably going to agree that it's a phenomenal product, but she might not be your target audience. You know, I think my buddy at, worked at Nike. He was calling me recently. He's like, hey, what do you think of these new shoes? You know, showing me these. I'm like, Dude, I'm not your target audience anymore, bro. Like I'm I used to love sneakers. I used to buy them all the time. But as I age, I got two kids. I don't, I'm not a sneakerhead as much anymore. So I'm not your target <laughs> audience. It's, I much, I appreciate you uh, calling me, asking for my opinion, but I have nothing to give you, you know? And so I think it's so important, Matt, I'm glad you kind of brought that out because it's, it really is important to kind of identify who the right client is uh, and making sure that you know what they want, like what their needs are, but not only what their needs are, but what they considered valuable. You're not creating value. You're just identifying what they considered valuable and exploiting it, right? And, That's a and really working towards that. Gabriel, that was such so insightful the way you 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 said that, and it brings me back to the episode of Silicon Valley when they released <laughs> their beta to all their friends, and they're like, it has it has ninety nine percent usability, and then they launch it, it's like got no one using it anywhere. <laughs> yep, I'm telling you, it's it's a interesting thing, but yeah, certainly, and don't uh, I, I mean this in the nicest way? Take take criticism with a grain of salt. You know, I I don't mm -hmm. think people are meaning to be rude uh, but they are trying to help you out and to succeed and uh, the last thing they want you to do is you know what's the what's the uh what's the definition of insanity is just doing the same thing over and over expect a different result right they don't want you to go insane doing something and expect a different result now now matt some of those those are some of the difficult things and you talked about scaling what are some of the, like the what were some of those moments are like oh yeah this is it we're gonna we're gonna take off what was that moment like so when you hear the same problem, we've heard, the, so we were primarily sales led growth for, we've been primarily sales led growth. So we, we, we talked with over 2000 marketers last year across enterprise agencies, and we've heard the consistent same problem over and over and over again. The creative process typically has multiple stakeholders, internal and external in, internal and external. They could have a creative strategist, a copywriter, a designer, a distributor, and all this stuff. And when we kept hearing the same problem over and over again and identifying how the market's changing with like all these, these new platforms emerging and the challenge of getting content, a lot of these people are specialists in one platform and they can't get to the other ones. Um, that was really kind of one of our major Eureka moments that focus on this, I, this customer profile, build it with these things. It's not, no one else is doing it today. Um, that was probably it just from hearing it over and over again and continuing to dig on that. 
That's, that's a great point. And one of the things you mentioned too, was like, you know, building the brand, essentially you had like all these different calls. How do you build an AI brand? Like where do you find your clients? Yeah. So it, we've used our product, our own product for digital ads to, to generate a lot of interest in brand. So you've, after, if you go look at our website, you're going to start to see a bunch of ads and they're all very AI related. And that drove hundreds of customers from the fortune 1000, even to us, like, from top of funnel though, like you mentioned the sales funnel, the smaller business customers with our older historical product and model could close very quickly. So we were able to generate revenue. Some of them would close the first day of a meeting. Um, and it was a very, very short so sales cycle. Um, we continue to use that tool. Plus uh, resellers has been a, a big addition. In the future, we wanna do API integrations where we can power content from data. Um, but one of the major things is we still use the digital ads. They're great for top of funnel, but these larger sales and enterprise are going to take six months to a year and a half to two years to close some of them. Um, and so that that's really been the evolution. And then the second thing I wanted to mention is when you talk about the sales funnel, we got really granular on when you're using that type of lead generation, um, digital ads plus public relations. So we, we were a tech crunch disrupt finalist in 2022 for Gen AI. Oh, so nice. the year before, we were the first generative AI company on TechCrunch Disrupt. The next year in 2023, they had a majority of them were gen AI companies. <laughs> <laughs> so these little things, you know, Hikari did really well getting us in and we were the final pitch there. And these things drive a lot of interest. So combination of PR, networking. Um, this year, it will be partnerships will be a huge, one, huge thing as the product evolves. And then API integrations with companies that have a lot of access to a lot of first party data that you could go power with final content generation. Nice. Now let's dumb it down for me. Cause I'm not too big of the tech guy. What in the heck is API integration? So it's, it's someone else's technology and they can directly connect to our technology in their system. So a customer basically is in the same process of using their platform, say they're say you're a, a data and analytics company and you're analyzing a bunch of purchase data for a retailer. Well, OmniKey stream, seamlessly would just automatically connect in, be able to look at certain data and then produce the content finished images on their platform. So the, cust the end customer doesn't even know like OmniKey is part of it. It's just directly into their platform, someone else using your technology. You know, I got to say, folks, my wheels are turning right now because I'm in the healthcare space, right? My my job is to go out into communities, build a relationship with the community providers, talk about our services, essentially the sales funnel, right? I, I'm the outreach for that area. How let's kind of do like a case study because I, I love this service. I love AI. I love what it does and I love what it brings. It makes my job easier, makes my life more efficient, right? From from you know, you're you're really kind of talking about generating advertising and marketing, right? Building up. How how does AI generated advertising? How do you think it's going to change the future of social media marketing in general? Continue to be more personalized and much quicker. And when I say quicker, you have all this access to this data. One one time there's data. Most of the time there's data overload. So these brands have all this data. They don't know what's actionable. So one is you have to figure out what are the insights that can actually be used. <laughs> and um, Two is for like, let's just say for healthcare would be if say there's something on the news, I like this, like a major news event happens to date that impacts your, your, your company better. It makes your company very viable today. Like I want to go buy it. Well, you could go from thinking of that idea, seeing the news, using some of that news in an ad and launching it on digital within a short period of time, hours or a day. In the past, you would see the you would see the news. You'd be like, "Oh, hmm, that's great for my company." You know, a lot of people are going to be interested, and it could take you three months to go through the process of thinking of the idea. How can I go think about this creative creatively to launching a campaign and having it approved? For example, I can give you one for I'm not the creative person at our company. I'm the business person, but I use our product all the time. I'm like trying to figure out how can I if I can use our product. The end users can use it. So <laughs> agencies are a big focus of ours today because they have lots of customers with lots of content needs. So like our technology um, was able to think of this idea of scale content, not hours, right? 
empower your agency teams to, to do less hours with scaling content to all these places. It also said, put a picture of a team climbing a mountain. So I created this ad concept with within like 10 minutes of a, a, of a team scaling a mountain, applied motion, you know, a motion, four second motion to it with generative AI. And you have a full campaign for one specific ideal customer profile. And that's just the beginning because yes, the future again, you have AI avatars now. There's two ways we think of video. One is you have a bunch of brand assets called B-roll and production assets. You can use AI to help you piece together into super cuts with your brand assets. The second is AI avatars that are continuing to get better. Gabriel, we could train AI on you and we could feed it scripts made by AI that you approve. And all of a sudden you could have 15 pieces of localized content immediately with you saying it. It's it's not perfect and some brands don't want to do it, but it's getting better every day. Yeah, and I, I gotta agree with folks, uh, uh, AI, the, the growth in AI the last couple, just the last year has been phenomenal. Um, I use it. Uh, so folks, when you, this is a great opportunity to have a shameless plug. So when you're following at the shades of E on Instagram, TikTok, and LinkedIn, all those other folks, all those other social sites, those reels I create, I use AI, right? And so that really, because I, again, I'm talking about trying to be efficient, uh, trying to also create value back to the consumer. And I got to tell you, uh, the ease of of using it and also just kind of what it helps me do, how it kind of helps me become a little bit more uh, just quicker on what I need to do, right? Um, now, in, in your experience, do you feel like AI is going to be a disruptor to the point where people should be concerned about it? The only option is to embrace it right now, because like I said, it won't eliminate jobs, but if you're not learning how to use it, you're going to be left in, left in the dust. Uh, it's hard to predict the outcome because we're still in the very, very early stages. Like people start are starting to see like what it can do, but they haven't successfully figured out how to solve entire business problems with it. And then the technology and they keep improving and then people are going to figure out business problems. But the way you look at it is, this is a great stat, Gabriel, that I like to say. S believe it or not, 75% of Fortune 1000 companies believe that they could cease to exist if they don't properly integrate AI into their business within the next five years. The second stat that's interesting is that uh, the average length of an S&P 500 company was 33 years in 1970 or 1965. It's now like 15 years. So, oh, wow. yeah, so it's decreased that much. So what's what does that mean? Companies have to move faster. They have to implement technology faster. The old ways of just playing defense doesn't work because the scale effect multiplies right now with AI. Like you'll hear people say with five people, you can have a billion dollar company and stuff. You know, like a lot of people are predicting that type of efficiencies. So the only option is to embrace it and try to figure out ways that, you know, you can learn so you're prepared for that moment. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that's a pretty interesting stat, you know, that mentioned the 15 years of S&P 500, because you know, this morning, you know, I was sitting here, you know, watching the early morning news and this, this commercial comes on about these new yoga stretch out for women, right? And it was this very provocative, they're all dancing and they're like, like having fun, right? And I'm like, oh, it must be, you know, Lululemon. And it was a completely new brand I've never even heard of. And they're explicitly at Dick Sporting Goods. And I was like, wow, it's kind of crazy how overnight these these new brands will pop up right and they will scale and they will go big uh, and to your point uh they're they're using you know possibly again personalized advertisement because again i'm watching it my wife sitting here next to it and she's even engaged she's like oh these look really cool again a brand new brand i always go back to like the at&t commercial when they're in the airlines right same exact <laughs> concept it has nothing to do with the phones. It has nothing that commercial has nothing to do with the phones, but they're talking about how the airlines are also charging you extra fees because everybody can relate to that personal issue. And then their AT&T is like, "Hey, that's not us, though." And so even though they're not talking about phones, they're talking about a pain point that they're resolving. Yeah. Like, hey, you don't have to worry about these little small things because we're not going to nickel and dime you. And it's just it's just interesting how that personal advertising is continuously evolving. Now, with that, how do you envision? How does how does AI help increase sales through AI personalization? Let's talk about specifically, because that's, I think, a lot of these folks here. How do I use it to increase sales? Yeah, it's to take those inputs that you have, the main types of customers, data from purchasing their locations, for example, 
all these are great inputs for AI that can generate content much quicker. Um, that's really the major immediate one. You can just learn from data quicker. You know your audiences, like you mentioned, airlines, retail, banking. You can just plug in. This is the audience. This is the buyer in the company. This is where they're located. They're located in, you know, uh, the north northwest. Pacific Northwest. <laughs> and all of a sudden you have this content that's just talking to those people that are in that 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 little area. And you can scale that so easily today with AI. Um, and then just switch certain things out. And it will just continue to get better with those type of inputs. And then the second thing is we're already doing this, but it can learn from how you speak, how you write, how your brand wants to be portrayed. That's just going to continue to get better where it knows you better than you know yourself. And it's going to be able to produce a similar type of thing that you're trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great, great point. And it's like, you know, constantly evolving as entrepreneurs and understanding that you need to also evolve your sales pitch and your sales ideas to your consumers. Um, you know, I truly do believe the riches are in the niches, right? But that doesn't mean that a niche product um, doesn't have to create any value, right? You have to have, like, for example, you can sell somebody with lockjaw gum if you sell them on the value of clean breath. Don't talk about chewing, right? Talk about their clean breath. Talk about how the in, the value of that, right? And you can sell anybody on anything except you have to find the right value. And I think this is where the AI personalization really comes into play and really helps you identify what they consider, uh, what, what their values are, and then how you can leverage that. Again, I hate when people say we're out there creating value. You do not create value. People already have an ex expectation of what they consider as valuable. You just need to identify what they consider as valuable and then work on that. Right? There's one other point. One other point on that as well. I, I forgot to mention was the platforms in the past, you were able to really target ages, all these different metrics, demographic stuff, demographic items, and they continue to remove that. So what the platforms have done, and when I say platforms like Meta and Google that are selling ad space is they have these really, really smart algorithms that know all the end users. Like Gabriel, if you're looking at those workout pants on your IP address at your home, everyone in your home is going to start to see all these other workout pants yeah, yep. <laughs> on their devices. So that's why it's so critical to have lots of content now because they perform better a lot of the time than, than more specific targeting because the platforms are getting so good with directing them to the right place. Yeah. And you know, folks, I, I, I made the mistakes when I first was starting out this podcast of no way Facebook's smarter than me. I'm going to, I'm going to pick and click my own target audience because I know my target audience better. No, you're not. We're not smarter than the computers, folks. I I, I'm, I would be the first one to admit it. I was like, my target marketing was crap. I wasn't paying all this money for very low clicks. And then as soon as I'm like, you know what, let Facebook algorithm take care of or the meta algorithm take care of it. And all of a sudden you see clicks increase pretty quickly. It's it's so they they know what they're doing. Now, you know, um, let's 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 kind of talk about the future. What what where do you envision your guys going? Well, we are going to continue to build this product that has, you know, many, we're going to automate every area of advertising we can. There's still going to be that 10% human approval at the end, review, edit, and approval, but we want to continue to build in today. We can automate most of images, motions, um, move more and more into video because multivariate testing includes all this. We do video today, certain aspects of it, but none of it's perfect. Like when you see a generative AI video, it's someone piecing together 10 different creative tools and then sharing, look what I made with AI. Yeah, well, if you spend a few hours and piece together six different tools, you can do it, but it still has like this, I would say some of them are cool, but it has like almost like this alien watching a video type. Like, did you see the beer commercial where uh, the everyone was partying and like, it was kind of like their head, all their bodies were morphed and stuff in the backyard. It looked really cool, but it's not near perfect. So it's just going to continue to improve. And then we're going to get more into avatars, predicting what you're thinking um, as we continue to add Google gla like glasses and all this other yeah. stuff that augments reality. Um, there's just so, so much you can, we can do. And it's going to be really exciting to see, to see where it goes. It's, it's really, really exciting, but it's also a little bit, the parts of it are scary for me is when you have little kids, I think you mentioned you have two kids. They're so connected to devices today. Like you hope that they can really use technology to make their lives better, but then also have some of those things we had when we were growing up that were, you know, the best things of going outside and, you know, building a tree house and <laughs> disconnecting and, 
And uh, cause your brain just can't be connected digitally all the time. It just doesn't function the same. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's kind of funny. You mentioned that, you know, like as there's a lot of things like back in the day, I'm like, man, I remember we had dial up internet. I remember we didn't have internet at first. Right. And then we had dial up internet. And now you're, st- now the progression is just like skyrocketing, right? You just mm-hmm. this evolution uh, very quickly. Now with that said, what is, what is one of the things that you wish you would have known before you started out this journey that you know now that you wish you would have known or, or what maybe what's some advice that you would give other aspiring entrepreneurs that are listening? Yeah. So one is you mentioned before, I, I doing a lot of different things in at and I, I had tenacity. You, you fail so much um, that carried over to here. Like no matter what, there's no immediate gratification. So any startup person, any young person that's starting something, just know it's going to be hard 90% of the time. And 10%, you're going to have these successes. And one of the things that I still have trouble doing is actually letting myself feel good during that 10%. <laughs> it's like, you're always striving for more. So really take that in when you have the good times, but no, most of it's going to be hard. Like you hear some of the people like Elon Musk say, most people don't want to be me <laughs> because that's how hard he's working. Um, just know that most of it's going to be hard. There's going to be lots of trial and error. Um, I had never been in a startup before this. So like building a product is such a unique process of having the right pieces. I think just the learnings from that after the first time will will make it easier um, because I don't know how else you do it without trying and learning. Yeah. <laughs> um, the right people to, to partner with, to have on your team, um, what your skills, how your skills complement others within your company. Um, a lot of those things the next time, but I, I can't really give advice besides the fact of just get yourself out there and try it and make sure like if you make a mistake, learn from it. And then the second thing is always be trying to skill up. Like when we talk about AI today, a couple of things I like to mention is read the newsletters. Um, I have a handful of them. One's Ben's Bites that I really like that every day they send me all the latest news on tech. They have you, they give you like 10 applications you can, that are new. I go test out three or four of those free ones a week just to try them. And then, so I have a better understanding of where the technology is going. I, I think that's a constant thing people should build into their routine today. I love it. In fact, you know, I'll share with you the, the 2024 motto folks. It's I actually have it written on my whiteboard. So that's what I'm kind of looking over here to the right. It's embrace growth, seek knowledge, and lead with purpose. So that's my 2024 purpose, uh, 2024 motto. And I truly mean that. I really want to try to continue to grasp knowledge and learn more. Like I want to be a sponge because, you know, Matt, as you alluded to, AI is going to continue to change the future of, of uh, how we look at things. And we're seeing it already, right? We're, we're seeing it across the board in a lot of different areas. And you're starting to see downsizes in some of these large organizations because we're becoming more efficient using this product. Now, that is not to scare folks to say, hey, stop. No, that's actually saying, hey, this might be a great opportunity to how, how can you create something uh, using AI as well, right? Now, Matt, who would be the typical clients, folks listening, who, who wants to contact you and how do they contact you? Or who do you want to contact you and how do they contact you? Sure. So we partner with mid-market slash enterprise businesses across e-commerce, retail, SaaS, health, healthcare um, agencies, anyone producing a bunch of advertisements or copy for different places, and then technology partners that might want to use their data to power content for their customers and have an additional value at. Nice. And then how can they get in contact with you? And then what's the website? Sure. Go, go to www.omniki, O-M-N-E-K-Y.com. You can schedule a demo there and put on the note you heard about in the Shades of Entrepreneurship. Second, you could reach out to me at Matt Swally on LinkedIn or email me at matt at omniki.com, O-N-E-K-Y.com. And this is a great opportunity to plug the Shades of Entrepreneurship newsletter where all this information will be. Again, you'll have Matt's uh, email information, his contact for LinkedIn. You'll have the website. You'll also have a a transcription of this uh, conversation on the shadesofe.com website. So you can also enter it there. This video will be posted seven days before it airs on Patreon. So if you'd be so gracious to join us on Patreon, it's $5 a month that helps support the podcast. It helps bring us all these guests and helps with the marketing and all that other fun stuff. So Matt, is there any last words you'd like to say before we leave? For all the listeners out there, if you haven't taken that chance into entrepreneurship and you're you're kicking the tires, 
do it. I agree. You can always go back to what you were doing before. (laughs) Yeah, I agree. And you can also just, you know, do a slow runway if you like as well. But I, I will say, you know, I agree with Matt and don't, don't beat yourself up if your first product or iteration is, isn't the best. Um, you know, nobody started at the finish line, right? Everybody started kind of at the starting line and they slowly got there. Uh, if you look back at some of my podcast episodes and some of my marketing, it's not very good folks. But as I continue to evolve and get better and learn, right, you know, knowledge is power and experience as well. So get out there and experience life. Don't forget to be kind, drink some water and thank you and have a great night.